If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try the question on your own before listening on. In the picture, we have a charged disk with an electron placed above the center of that charged disk. And in this chapter, there is derived an expression for the electric field that is produced by a charged disk. So let's take a look at that equation. So capital E would represent the electric field produced by the charged disk. We have the surface charge density, which is actually given to us in the question to be this value right here. And then we have epsilon, which is a constant. Z would represent the distance above the center of the charged disk. And so in this picture, the distance Z would be represented by this line right here. And then R, of course, would be the radius of the disk itself. We'll notice that the surface charge density on the disk is positive, and therefore, at this point, the electric field produced by this charged disk will point away from the disk. So we could draw an electric field vector pointing away from the charged disk and label it with a capital E. Now, because we have a charged particle located at a point in space where there is an electric field, that charged particle will experience an electric force. We recall from this chapter that the electric force experienced by a charged particle is going to equal the product of the electric field and the charge. In this case, the charge is an electron, so perhaps instead of using Q, we can use the letter lowercase e. Now, for the purpose of this question, we can assume that the electric force is the only force acting on the electron, and therefore it becomes the net force. And so we can take the electric force, which again is this product right here, and set that equal to mass times acceleration. This is just an expression of Newton's second law, which tells us that the net force acting on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. We could go ahead and solve this equation for the acceleration by dividing both sides by the mass so that it cancels out on the right hand side. And therefore we can see the acceleration is equal to the electric field times the charge divided by the mass of the electron. Now let's not forget that the electric field, which is the uppercase E, is given by this expression right here. So why don't we go ahead and take that bracketed expression for the electric field and substitute it in for the electric field in this equation here. And so this large expression right here will serve as the expression that we'll use to determine the acceleration for parts A, B, and C. Why don't we actually go ahead and write that acceleration expression over here in the center of the screen. And now let's examine part A, which tells us that the electron is released at a distance of R. And so if we refer back to this diagram here, the distance from the electron to the center of the disk, which is this Z, is given as R for part A. So we're going to come over to our equation and substitute in R for the z, both here as well as here. And now we're going to algebraically clean this up. We have r squared plus r squared underneath that square root, which will become, of course, 2r squared. Now, the radical 2r squared, which appears in the expression, can be thought of as radical 2 times radical r squared. And of course, radical r squared is just r, so that's going to become radical 2 times r. We could see then that the r in the numerator will cancel with the r in the denominator. And then don't forget that we have a placeholder of 1 in the numerator. We can combine the terms in the parentheses by putting this 1 over 1 and then finding a common denominator. So what we'll do is multiply this denominator by radical 2 and then also the numerator by radical 2. Once we have the common denominator, we can combine the fractions into a single fraction as follows. Algebraically, the term 2 epsilon naught can be pushed down to the denominator. And I guess if we wanted to get a little fancy here, we could rationalize this denominator. And to do that, we can multiply it by radical 2, but that means we'd have to multiply the numerator by radical 2 as well. Don't forget to distribute that radical 2 to both of these terms. So radical 2 times radical 2 will become just 2, and then radical 2 times the minus 1 will become minus radical 2. 
And then finally, this two can also be pushed down to the denominator, and when we multiply, this coefficient here will become a four. And at this point, we can plug in the known values. Sigma, we recall, is the surface charge density, which is given in microcoulombs, so we're gonna to have to multiply that by 10 to the minus six to change it into coulombs per meter squared. The charge E of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Epsilon is a constant equal to 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. And then M is the mass of the electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So we'll plug in those four values, and when we do that, we get roughly 1.16 times 10 to the 16 meters per second squared. So this finally is the correct answer to part A. We can now move on to solve part B, which tells us that the distance from the electron to the center of the disk is R divided by 100. Remember that distance is represented by the letter Z. So we're going to have to come into our acceleration formula, and this time we'll substitute an R divided by 100 in for both of these Zs. Now let's not forget that we're actually squaring the z that was in the bottom, so that's going to become r squared over 100 squared. Of course, 100 squared is 10,000. We can add the r squared over 10,000 plus r squared by giving the r squared on the right-hand side a common denominator, so we'll have to multiply here by 10,000 as well as the numerator to make 10,000 r squared. And therefore, when we add them together, we'll have 10,001 r squared over 10,000. So coming off over here on the side to try to simplify this square root, we have 10,001 r squared over 10,000. Now because r squared is a perfect square, it can come outside of the radical, so it's going to be r outside. 10,000 is also a perfect square, so it's actually going to be r over 100, and then what's left is the 10,001. We can then see that the r over 100s will cancel in the numerator and denominator. And don't forget that placeholder of 1. So now we have in parentheses 1 minus 1 over this square root here. And so we're going to have to find a common denominator. So the 1 can become the square root of 10,001 over the square root of 10,001. And then we're subtracting 1 over the same denominator. Because they have the same denominator, we can then pack them together into a single fraction. We could then rationalize that denominator by multiplying it by 10,001, and then the same thing in the numerator. We'll have to distribute the, ten, the radical 10,001 into both terms. Notice that radical 10,001 times radical 10,001 will become just 10,001, and then minus, when we multiply these together, we're still gonna have the square root of 10,001, and this will be all over 10,001. So this becomes what was in parentheses here. Let's, let's push the 2 epsilon naught as well as 10,001, that entire term, down to the de denominator. So we're going to have 2 epsilon naught times the mass times 10,001. Actually, 2 times 10,001 is going to be 20,002. So we can change that up. And then at this point, we can once again plug in the same known values for sigma, e, epsilon, and the mass. And when we do that, we get about 3.94 times 10 to the power of 16 meters per second squared. So this is the correct answer to part B. And don't forget that for sigma, which is that charge density, to multiply it by 10 to the minus 6. So it was actually 4.0 times 10 to the minus 6. And then under part C, which has a value of r divided by 1,000 for the distance from the electron to the center of the disk. Again, that's z, so let's substitute in r divided by 1,000 in for both z's. And then we'd have to go through a fun round of algebra yet again. For now, we'll omit that step. It's very similar to what we did in Part B. When you go through and simplify this expression in the same manner as Part B, but when you simplify it, you should get this expression, which is basically the same as Part B, except we're adding an extra zero in for those terms that contain a large number of zeros. When you punch this into your calculator, after plugging in the constants, you get 3.97 times 10 to the power of 16 meters per second squared. So this is the correct answer to part C. Now notice that this number was only slightly bigger than the acceleration that we had found in part B, which was 3.94 times 10 to the sixth 
fifteenth meters per second squared. And that relates to the final part of this question. Why does the acceleration magnitude increase only slightly, which it did. It went from 3.94 to only 3.97. And the reason for that could be considered as follows. Let's place the electron at its current location here. And let's consider the charges that are on the outer rim of the disk. Now, all of those positive charges are going to exert a force on the electron. They would be attractive forces. So they're all pulling the electron towards the disk. And we could see, it's a little sloppy, but we could see that there would be a net downward pull overall on the electron. However, let's now move the electron a little, or actually much closer to the center of the disk, perhaps almost at the center right here. Again, let's consider the positive charges that are located on the periphery of the disk. They will once again attract the electron, but notice what's happening. This positive charge over here will pull the electron this way, and this positive charge on the opposite side will pull the electron in the opposite direction. So those forces will actually cancel each other out. Same thing over here. This positive charge will pull the electron this way, but then this positive charge will pull the electron in the opposite direction, and those forces will cancel. So the force contributions from the outer charges become increasingly diminished as the electron moves towards the center of the disk. They eventually cancel out. And so with forces canceling out, that will indeed diminish the amount of acceleration on the electron.